right, Deuteronomy 19, 20, and 21 tonight. It's been a while since we've been in Deuteronomy, so I thought I'd just go gung-ho and jump through three chapters. How's that? There's no better way of doing it. Deuteronomy chapter 19, we'll, we'll start there. How's that? Um, here in this, uh, this portion of Scripture, we... we I've entitled the, the, the message, A Purchased People. When you purchase something, you own it, and you get to do what you want with it. And the children of Israel had been redeemed or purchased by the Lord out of slavery in the land of Egypt. They were his. They were his own special people. And so as we see the Lord then giving them direction and commands, these were the things that the Lord had for them as his own people. And because they belonged to him, he had every right to tell them how he wanted them living, but, it, but it also how he would provide for them. And within all of this, we see that God is a very merciful God. And we see the Lord's relationship with this people was a very special relationship. It, of course, points to the relationship we have with the Lord today as Christians. We are also are a purchased people and our lives are not our own. He is the potter. We are the clay. He's the decision maker. And he is ever bit as much of a merciful and kind and gracious God as he has ever been. And so we see through God's relationship with the Jews in the Old Testament, especially in these commands that are given to the children of Israel before they enter into the promised land. It's Moses' last sermon to them before they cross over the Jordan and go into the promised land. We see the heart of the Lord, and we see in these, this relationship God had with the children of Israel through these words in Deuteronomy much about our relationship we have with the Lord today. Let's consider these three cities of refuge, which we had actually already studied when we had studied in the, in the book of uh, Numbers in chapter 35. And so we won't take too deep of a dive into the three city, cities of refuge now on the west side of the Jordan. There were three cities on the east side of the Jordan that we had already looked at. We looked at the purpose of the city of refuge and what it was for. Of course, it was a place for a manslayer, uh, somebody that killed someone accidentally or without any premeditation to go to before he would be avenged by a loved one of the, the person who had died. And in, within this, we see the Lord provided a place for mercy, a place for mercy, a place of safety uh, for, for one who had harmed another. Uh, and so, but a couple of things I want to note as we go through these opening verses here. In verse 19, verse, or chapter 19, verse 1, and it says, And when the Lord your God has cut off the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving to you, and you dispossess them, so those are the Canaanites, you know, on the, the western side, and you dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall separate three cities for yourself in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So remember, Moses is talking to them. They're about to go into the promised land here. And he says, when you go there, set aside these three cities. Then he says in verse 3, and you shall prepare roads for yourself and divide into three parts the territory of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to inhabit, that any manslayer may uh, flee there. And so the, the thing I would note about verse 3 is that they were to prepare roads. There was to be a, kind of a, a division here so that no one region was any too far away from one of these cities. It's not like all three cities were packed into the south or over to the west or up in the north. They were, they were divided out nicely, and then there were roads that were to be paved so that there would be a quick access to any one of these cities. Now, the land of Israel is, um, is like the, 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 the size of, what is it, uh, like New Jersey, I believe. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a small land, and so there's three cities that they would be able to get to within any one spot. And, uh, and so this is important, then when we consider verse 5, and, or verse 4, and this is... And this is the case of the manslayer who flees there that he may live, okay? Notice that. God desired life 
for this one who had unintentionally killed. Notice, whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally, not having hated him in, the, in time past, as like when a man goes out into the woods uh, with his neighbor to cut timber and his hand swings a stroke with the ax to cut down a tree and the head slips off the handle and strikes his neighbor and he dies. He wasn't trying to kill his neighbor and he shall be able to flee to one of those cities lest the avenger of blood, that's another very important little phrase there in verse 6, the avenger of blood, while his anger is hot, pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long. And he killed him, though he was not deserving of death since he had not hated his victim in time past. And so the, the deal would be that the city would be close, unintentional, some sort of uh, lumberjack accident we're talking about. And, uh, and then the, the avenger of blood, who was he? Remember, this is that fascinating word, goel in the Hebrew, which is actually used in the book of Ruth as the kinsman redeemer. So it's the same word, it's the same person. It would be like a, an, an uncle within the family who was a wealthy uncle, a protector sorts, a godfather sorts within the family. And he would do a couple of things. He'd provide for you if you lost your land and he could buy you back. But also if you lost your life, he was gonna kill the person who killed you. And so it's kind of the same guy. It's this protector type with, that was there. And, and that strikes us as this, is that the Lord is our city of refuge. Like we run to him for mercy. But we're also, he's also the avenger of blood. <laughs> and we're fleeing to him from his wrath. And that's the gospel. We flee to Christ to save us from the wrath of God. Wow, he's both. And, and so that, that we unpack that quite a bit when we studied in Numbers 35. But here I just want us to picture the Lord said, I own you, and I, when you come into the land, accidents are going to happen, and you're going to falter, and you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to hurt one another, but I want you to know that there's going to be a place of mercy, and there's going to be a road paved, and that entrance to that place is going to be close, and, and it's near, and it's available for you, and that's the Lord's heart for us. That as we walk through this life and we falter and we fail and we hurt others unintentionally, that there is mercy near. It's close. It's Christ. He's, he's for us, not against us. In verse 8, he says, Now the Lord your God, when the Lord your God, notice I like this, <laughs> when the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your fathers and gives you the land which he promised to give you to your fathers and you keep all these commandments and do them which I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways, then you shall add three more cities to yourself besides these three. And so the Lord says, if, if you obey me and Part of the promise of obedience was I'll even enlarge your territory anymore. Then I want you to add even three more cities. And you know what? I see that and the cities are places of mercy. And when you are faithful to the Lord and the Lord increases your opportunity to serve him, you also, he'll also increase the mercy that he gives you. Because with, with great you know, with, you know, with much responsibility comes much opportunity for failure. And, and the more people you, you minister to, the more people you can hurt and the more mercy you need. And Paul said to the churches, grace to you and peace. Paul said to the pastors, grace and mercy and peace be to you. He added mercy to the pastors. Those that have large opportunities need much mercy and uh, so verse 10 and 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 the lord said lest lest innocent blood be be shed in the land of course in your midst uh, of the um, of the land which the lord your god is giving to you um, as uh, an inheritance and and there the guilt of the bloodshed be upon you then verse 11 but if anyone he says but on on the contrary but if anyone hates his neighbor, lies in wait for him, 
uh, and rises up against his neighbor and strikes him mortally so that he dies and he flees to one of these cities. Then the elders of that city uh, shall bring him from there and deliver him over to the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Your eyes shall not pity him that you shall put away the guilt of the innocent blood from Israel uh, that it may go well with you. So the Lord said on, on the Contrarily, though, if, if somebody does lie in wait and it is a murder type situation, that person is not going to find that mercy. And so the Lord delineates between those high handed presumptuous sins of those rebellious sins against the Lord, uh, of which there's, there's no mercy. That's why David said, Lord, keep me back from these presumptuous, high handed sins. Uh, keep me back from just rebelliously sinning against you. And Paul said, when someone's overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And we know, what the, we know the Lord has mercy on us. And even as we falter and fail, the Lord sees our hearts as his people. And, and he extends that mercy to us. Of course, the most grievous sins can be forgiven when the heart is brought down with that brokenness and like, God have mercy on me. What did I do? I just wrecked everything. But it's at the place of tenderness that the Lord extends mercy. It's the place of brokenness that the Lord says, hey, this is the place of refuge and this place of rescue for you. And so if you're in temptation today, I want to remind you that the Lord has a place of refuge for you. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation, will what? Make a way of escape, a place of refuge for you, that you may be able to bear it. I was reading an article on temptation. Now, however pleasurable, this is from Scott Hubbard. However pleasurable, however powerful, however com compelling temptation feels, Jesus will ultimately prove more so. He himself will be our escape, I like that, and the one to whom we gladly run. His grace is greater than all our sin. His love greater than all our desires. And, and his refuge greater than all our temptations. And so he is the one to whom we run. There's mercy in the land. There's mercy for you today. Let's consider a God who likes private property. Verse 14. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set in your inheritance, which you will inherit, and inherit it in the land your God is giving you to possess. Yeah, Abraham didn't own any land except a burial plot for, for his wife, Sarah, and then eventually for himself. He was a sojourner in the land. But the Lord said, you're going to come into the land and you're going to possess the land. And the Lord's behind private property. And the Lord's behind ownership because he owns us and, and he had, he's going to prepare a place for us. But the, the reason the Lord was big behind private property in the land of Israel and the names listed is because it would forever say like, this is my people and these are my tribes and this is the land that I've given them. The Lord is one who marks out our boundaries and our borders in this life. And he, and he grants to us a place to be uh, the psalmist said, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. The Lord has crafted your life. He set you right where you're at. And those lines have fallen to you in pleasant places. Even if sometimes the grass might seem greener on the other side of the hill. <laughs> the Lord knows just what he's doing for you. And he has a place for you in this life and in the next. Um, verse 15 now. Um, I'm going to break down and throw my glasses on. I'm just struggling too much here. I try to do it, but, you know, I'm getting old, so here we go. Um, one witness shall not rise against a man uh, concerning any in, uh, iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So, of course, there wouldn't be any uh, 
crime that would be punished, especially the crime of murder, unless there were, there were ample witnesses, two or three at least. Verse 16, if a false witness rises against any man and, and testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men uh, in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And so if a false witness would come, they would gather the court. Let's hear what you have to say. They would gather other witnesses. Verse 19, then you, um, and, and ver- verse 18, I'm sorry. And the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. And you shall put away the evil from among you. And those who remain shall hear and fear hereafter. They shall not again commit such evil among you. You shall, your eye shall not pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And so if a false witness stood up and was trying to have someone falsely accused and, 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 thus, and thusly maimed or put into prison or put to death, that false witness would have that come crashing down upon him. Yes, the Lord was a Lord, was a God of just, is, is, a God of justice, and in the, the nation Israel established laws of justice and did say that you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In the New Testament, of course, Jesus said we should extend mercy, but in no way being any less uh, just in his operation, of course. But here the big takeaway from these verses I would just like us to gather is that the Lord's not big on false accusation. We, we sometimes falsely accuse, don't we? You know, uh, sometimes, you know, maybe if you're a passive aggressive kind of person that somebody, you know, you're kind of backed into a corner and then you, you give some high, like, like some over the top statement about somebody. Well, you're just like this and you're kind of, or we will accuse falsely at times. But have you ever been accused falsely? It just doesn't, you know, somebody's after you. The Lord's not big on false accusation. And I'm encouraged because uh, Revelation 12, 10 tells us we all have an accuser who stands up and accuses us falsely. Listen, Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of, of our God and the power of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And so Satan stands up before the throne of God to accuse you day and night. She's like this. He's like that. And the Lord considers it false accusation as we're robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Lord says, my blood paid for that sin. What sin? False accusation. And notice that verse, the accuser of the brethren has been what? Cast down. Cast down. I love it. And so the, the, Lord, the Lord will bring every secret thing into judgment. And so that's why we run to the secret place. We run to the Holy of Holies. We come boldly to the throne of grace uh, where only our sin could be atoned. For truly, if the Lord were to mark iniquity, not one of us would stand. And so we have one place of refuge. We have one place of mercy. We have one place where every accusation falls to the ground. And that's right there at the foot of Christ. Verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 20 then, and we, we move on in our text. We continue forth. Second chapter, one behind, two to go. Uh, verse uh, 1, it says, And when you go into battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, that's exactly where they were going, by the way. Remember, they're going into the promised land where they saw the giants, great and, and the giants, the Anakim, and the cities fortified up to heaven. Uh, they're going to go in and face mighty nations. And the Lord says, when you go in, don't be afraid. He'd even say to Joshua, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Be of, be of good courage. The Lord is with you wherever you go. And so the Lord says, when you go in, don't be afraid. The battle is mine, verse 2, so it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. 
and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart be faint. Don't be, don't be timid. Don't peel back, but be aggressive. Move forward. Do not be afraid. Do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is with you, is he who goes before, who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So why, so they were not to be afraid, verse three. Why were they not to be afraid? Was it because their enemy was small? No, their enemy was greater than they. Why were they not to be afraid? Verse four, because the Lord was going to go with them. He was going to fight for them. He was going to save them. So the Lord is, the Lord is with us. And the Lord was telling the children of Israel to move forward. And so we would picture them. They were actual people fighting actual wars, actually marching around Jericho once a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day, right? And, and they were going in to, to fight actual battles, but we, we fight battles nonetheless here as, as believers. I mean, we, we move forward in our Christian walk. We, we trust Christ and we uh, fight the good fight of faith, right? And so verse five, uh, then the Lord says this, and I love, I love this next little chunk. Then the officer shall speak to the people saying, what man is there who has built a new house and has, de- and has not dedicated it? Like you haven't really even got to live in this thing yet. Let him go and return to his house. We don't want him thinking about his nice new house when he's on the battlefield. Lest he die in the battle and another man just live in his house and dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten its fruit? We don't want him thinking about his vineyard while he's at battle. Like, if you want to go home to your vineyard, go home to your vineyard. Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not yet married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man marry her. Oh, and then on top of that, those guys can all go home. And then in verse 8, and then the officer shall further speak to the people. And, and if anybody really doesn't want to be here and you're afraid, you go home too. And what man is there who's fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house lest his the heart of his brethren faint like his and then verse 9 and it shall be now that you got your guys go to war with them and so it shall be when the officers have finished speaking to the people and weeding out the wimpies then uh then they shall make captains of the armies and lead the people right so the lord was just saying if you're going to go to war go to war If you're going to war half-heartedly, just stay back. Because this battle is not for the faint-hearted. It's not for the timid. And Paul said to Timothy in raising up young pastors, he said, who... who, uh, the." Go fight like athletes, fight like warriors and, and, and go into the battle. And Jesus called his disciples to count the cost when they were to go into to war or even to build one particular phrase. Luke 14, 8, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it or Luke 9. 62, but Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom. These two verses remind us of the Lord's call for discipleship. That when we follow after him, we say we're, we're all in. And Jesus said, if, if you don't hate your own life and hate your, he even says, even if you don't hate your family, and if like which one of you don't doesn't sit down at first and say, do I have enough to meet the delegation coming before me this war? And unless I faint halfway, like when we take a step to follow the Lord, we're saying, I'm going to go and I'm all in though. None go with me. Still, I will follow. And that's the call to discipleship. And that call can get shaken at times in our life. And there can be times when we say, I think I might want to go back and not go on anymore and it's there that the lord would say to us you're mine you've been bought at a price your life is not your own 
And this is, the, this is truly the, the walk that God has called us to as Christians. To be faithful to the very end. And to realize that, this, that we're citizens of heaven. We're ambassadors here. And we're, we're called to fight the good fight of faith. To lay hold on, on eternal life. Even our own family relations can get in the way. Jesus said Wh- whoever gets married has to care about the things of this world, how he'll please his wife. <laughs> this was the Lord's motivation in 1 Corinthians 7.32. But I want you to be without care. Like I want you to be without care in this life. He was, he was unmarried, cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Like, I just want you to be all in on my business. You're like, well, I'm married. I can't serve the Lord wholeheartedly. <laughs> well, yes, you can. 1 Corinthians seven twenty nine. it was just a couple of verses before that. Paul said this, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, like Jesus is coming. So that from now on, even those of you who have wives should be as though you have none. And this doesn't mean that you... Uh, this does not mean that you either disregard your wife or you're not tender toward her, but it means you bring her along your side and serve the Lord with her. It means that, that your life is not here just for the white picket fence, the American dream. It's saying, hey, honey, come see my, see my zeal for the Lord of hosts, you know, and, and uh, pull her up in that chariot with you. And you guys run the race with endurance that the Lord's called you to. And, um, And some of you ladies might need to do that for your man, as Jeremy mentioned on Sunday. (laughs) Um, the, uh, the Lord has, the Lord has called us to serve him faithfully and, and uh, wholeheartedly. And let's consider the last uh, portion of this, this chapter here, uh, quickly. And, and, uh, In verse 10, it says, And when you go near the city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And the Lord your God... uh, uh, And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil, uh, you shall plunder for yourself. And you shall eat the enemy's plunder, which the Lord your God gives you. Uh, Thus you shall do to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not cities of these nations. So they were, to, they were to proclaim peace to the cities that were farther out. And if the city said, okay, we'll have peace with you, then peace would come to them. But if they did not, if they rejected the offer of peace and rather came out to fight, they would be destroyed. The men killed utterly, women and children spared. It's much like the gospel. The Lord offers a message of peace through the blood of the cross. And those who receive forgiveness and those who embrace the gospel and are obedient to the gospel are recipients of peace, peace with God, and then the resulting peace of God. But those who reject the gospel and shake a fist to the Lord and say, I reject your offer of peace. (laughs) I reject your blood. I I come out against you. Well, those will be utterly destroyed. It is the gospel of peace uh, that is proclaimed and that we do, that we do proclaim. It's the salvation of men's souls and apart from which no man can be saved. And uh, then we uh, consider here in in verse 16, uh, but of the cities of these people, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes life. So, but on the contrary, All those nations that are right up close to you, uh, right there in the land, all those Canaanite cities, there would be no offer of peace to them. Just utter destruction. Verse 17, and you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, uh, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Uh, The Girgashite's missing from this list, only six given. Uh, Just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest you teach 
lest they teach to you according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. Uh, when you besiege a city for a long time, um, I'm going to wait on verse 19. Um, the Lord, uh, the Lord, so the Lord just simply says, for all those nations that are right in your land, utterly destroy them, lest you learn their practices. What were some of the practices of the Canaanites? One of the, one of the main practices of the Canaanites was, was soothsaying and demon worship. And, and because the Canaanites, like other peoples, were curious about the future. They had concerns and questions about the future. So they wanted to know the future. They wanted to know if everything was going to be okay for them in the future. And so because of that, and so in order to try to find out the future, they would offer sacrifices to the false gods. They would, they would conjure up soothsayers and dreamers and fortune tellers. Um, and then they even took it a little step further. They didn't want to just know the future, but then they wanted to control the future because they had concerns about the future. They wanted to make sure everything was going to be okay for them in the future. So then they started offering their babies into the hands of Molech to appease gods so that they could have a better future. Not just to know the future, but to control the future. Silly Canaanites. I mean, like, who cares about the future? <laughs> Come on. We're so susceptible to this sort of thing. So we're, we want, what's going to happen to me? And what can I do to control what happens to me? And we worry and we fear when all along the Lord. So I wrote this, I came up with this thought the other day. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I think I'm going to turn it into a bumper sticker. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's an old saying, of course. Like, can we just trust the Lord with our tomorrow? Do we have, or do we need to control it? to cheat and rob and lie and steal, to make our tomorrow what we want it to be? Or can we just be obedient today? How about this? Not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own things. I got it. <laughs> Sufficient for the day is its own trouble, right? Can we just leave it in his hands? Can we just do this? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let all these things be added to us. And so the Lord says, when you go in, just wipe these guys out because they have no idea about a sovereign God who sees the end from the beginning, who has your best in, in mind. And, and this is how I'll tell you you walk in the future. You walk with me today. And so if they're close at hand and, this, and they're right there and you have these things, you just utterly destroy them. Hey, we're pilgrims passing through. And so Peter said, 1 Peter 2.11, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. One of the fleshly lusts that war against the soul is our worry and concern about our life and our desire for pleasure in the future. The Lord has you. He's got you right where you need to be. No need to fret. Verse, verse 19. And it says, and, and, when, and when you besiege a city, I like this. Uh, I know I say that a lot because I like the whole Bible. But uh, uh, when you besiege a city for a long time while making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an ax against them. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use in the siege for the tree of the field is man's food. Only the trees which you know are not trees that are for food you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. So if you want to cut down trees for a siege mound to attack a city, great. Just don't use the fruit trees for that. For the fruit is man's food, the Lord says. And the Lord's big into fruit bearing trees. The Lord's a holder uh, Holder culturalist. Uh, the Lord is a gardener. Uh, I don't know. I, I've been able to say that word for years. 
horticulturalist. There, I got it right. Um, I just couldn't say it then. Uh, the Lord's a gardener. He cares about trees and he cares about fruit. And he's a master gardener. And he created the trees of the field and he creates the fruit. And he says, abide in me and you'll bear much fruit. And there's so many analogies. He says, listen, let the fruit trees and the, leave them in the ground. And let them bear the fruit. And the Lord takes delight in that. And, and, uh, and there's a parable Jesus told about a gardener who had a tree that didn't bear fruit for three years. He said, I'm, let's just tear it down. It's using up the earth. And, and the owner said, can we just give it one more shot? Let's dig around it, fertilize it, prune it, give it another year. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, then you can cut it down. And, you know, the Lord is so patient and he prunes and he, that we might bear more fruit. And, um, and one day I hope you can meet our in-laws, uh, Stephen's, uh, our son Stephen's uh, wife's parents, um, Rich and Christy. Pastor Rich leads Calvary Heritage in Brookings, Oregon. Such a sweet couple. They just bought a home. It's more accessible for Zach, who had that accident and is in the wheelchair. And this home came with a small orchard. And I was just walking the property the last time I was there with them. And, he, and we're, we're looking at all these trees. And Rich is so cool. And he just, um, he just says, uh, he's like, when you, all these trees were overgrown. There was nothing. There was no fruit. And he says, we just started tearing into them and digging around them and pr- cutting, hacking stuff off them. And he goes, and we got fruit. <laughs> and... Um, And then he just paused. He's a little philosophical. And he says, the Lord knows how to get fruit out of people's lives. And I'm like, that's right. The Lord doesn't give up. Like the Lord's like, you're ready. Like, I'm going to, we're going to dig around you. We're going to prune you. We're not giving up on you because I know how to get some fresh fruit from you. And so that's just what the Lord is in in the business of these days. One last chapter tonight. Uh, Verse 20, chapter 21. And if anyone is found slain lying in the field in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. And it shall be that the elders of the city nearest to the slain man will take a heifer which has not been worked and which has uh, not pulled, been pulled with a yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to the valley with flowing water, which is neither uh, plowed nor sown. And they shall break the heifer's neck right there in the valley. And then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless the, the name of the Lord uh, by their word, every controversy and every assault shall be settled, okay? So, so here's a dead body lying in the field. Who killed him? We don't know. Let's go to the nearest city, get the elders out, break a heifer's neck by some running water, right? And uh, we're going to settle this thing in verse 6. And then all the elders of the city nearest the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley... Uh, Then they shall answer and say, our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. We don't know who did this. Provide atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, and do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people. And atonement Uh, an atonement shall be provided on their behalf for the blood and you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. So even if a man was murdered, they don't know who did it, they would still seek the Lord's covering by bringing this animal out, breaking his neck, they'd wash their hands under running water. We're innocent of this, we don't know who did it and they would seek the Lord's cleansing and the forgiveness. This is what Pilate did on the night that Jesus was crucified, uh, when Pilate was going to give the order for his crucifixion, the Jews are saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says, bring me out some water. He knew the, he knew the Jewish practice. And he says, pour the water over my hands. And uh, when, uh, there's, the, there's the verse. I have it written down here too. Um, and uh, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, prevail, but that rather a tumult was rising. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this person. You see to it. And then what did the Jews say? 
And all the people answered and said, his blood be upon us and our children. Like we stand by the fact that this guy's a blasphemer. There'll be a day that the Jews' eyes will be opened collectively, nationally, and they'll realize they made the wrong decision on that day. And when they had said his blood be upon us, in some ways they're actually speaking prophetically (laughs) because his blood will wash them, it will be upon them, but in a cleansing tide. At first their guilt of his blood laid at their feet, but the Lord loved them so much he died for them. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And they would one day be cleansed by, by his blood. And so... It would be the death of an innocent animal that would cleanse and bring atonement there for the slain man in the field. And it's the blood of our spotless Lamb of God, Christ, who brings atonement for for our sin. What we see there just in the Old Testament law, though, is that God, again, was a God of mercy. He wanted to provide for them an opportunity where they could move forward with a clear conscience, even though something terrible happened in the field. Somebody killed somebody. And the Lord says, hey, you know what? You can be forgiven. You can move forward. And that is the way that the Lord delights to work in us and through us, giving, cleansing our conscience so we can move forward, right? And then in verse 10, it says, And when you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hand, and you take uh, them captive. And a little bit about a female captive here, and we find the Lord's tender heart toward women uh, come through time and time again in Scripture. And you see among the captives a beautiful woman. You desire her uh, and would take her for your wife. Well, then when you bring her home to your house, uh, she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She, let her mourn the death of her family. Her family's just died in war. Give her some space, bro. Verse 13. Give her time to mourn. Verse 13. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, remain in your house, and mourn her father and her mother a full month. And then after that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife, and make it right, and care for her. And if by chance, sometime down the road, verse 14, you, you want to put her away, and it shall be if you have no delight in her, and, and you go through the deep troubles of marriage, and you want to put her away, then, then you shall set her free. Just give her the certificate of divorce and let her go on her way. But you won't sell her for money. Don't mistreat her anymore. She's suffered enough. And you shall not treat her brutally because you've humbled her and humiliated her. And so the Lord just realized even in captive, like when, when they would go out to war, some of those that would be taken captive after the war would be women And the Lord wanted them to be treated well and to be treated kindly. And the Lord is such a gentleman. And he is, uh, the Lord is so tender toward us. And we see that is who our God is. And uh, verse, that's his character and nature. And verse 17, or verse 15, it says, And if a man has two wives, never a good idea. (laughs) The scripture's not advocating for this right here. It's not commending it. Um, it is not actively condemning it, but we do know God's intent from the beginning. Who knows Genesis 2, 24? And a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, not wives. <laughs> and then the two, not the three or the four or the five, and the two shall become one flesh. What's God's in- intent for marriage from the beginning? It's one man and one woman, right? That's God's intent from Genesis 2 before the fall. That's the best way to do it, okay? But the Lord's saying, there's times that guys do something really stupid and take more than one wife. And when that happens, this is always going to follow. There's going to be a rivalry. And, uh, and if they've born them no children, but, but one of them's loved and the other one's unloved, because no man can really love two masters, love two women, can he? And if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, and even Jacob loved Rachel and not so much Leah, uh, then it shall be on that day that he beque- bequeaths his possessions 
to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved wife, uh, the true firstborn, right? But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him double portion of all that he has, for he is beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. And so the Lord says, set your affections aside and do what's right and honor the unloved wife and bestow firstborn status on her son. And so it is there a time that affections creep in our own lives, right? As married people. And the Lord would say, set your affections aside and love your wife, love your husband, and do what's right. For that's the way the Lord has intended it. And that is the way that he's glorified in our marriages. And we put him on the throne of our hearts. And we put, put his way first. And so then in verse, verse 18, um, the Lord then says, uh, and if a man like this could ever happen, this sort of thing. And if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, who even after they discipline him will not heed them. <laughs> well, this is what they used to do in those kinds of cases. Verse 19, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out of the, to the elders of the city and to the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and he will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard then all the men of the city will just stone him to death with stones. Parents, note that verse and read it to your children. <laughs> then all the many men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, and you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This goes a little bit about what we were talking about, the law on Sunday. Yeah, if this happened, if like... Mom, why, you know, what happened to that other brother we used to have? <laughs> well, you know, there he is in the backyard, and he got into too, a little too much mischief, you know, for our liking. And, uh, you know, your kids might be a little, you might be able to curb a little rebellion with that kind of aggressive uh, chastening but you're not, you're not going to change their hearts. Yes, fear can be a motivator toward humility, but it's God's grace and his goodness that leads us to repentance. And ultimately, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ through the new covenant that can alone change the heart. And so we preach God's high and holy standard. We exercise discipline in the home. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Beat him with the rod, you won't kill him. The rod of correction will drive foolishness far from him. But it, but it prepares the way for grace and for relationship and for the truth of the gospel so that the heart can be changed from above, from the inside out. And so the final verse points us right to that and what Jesus did for us. The last two verses tonight. And if a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall sure, surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance for he who is hanged uh, is accursed of God. So the Lord says, if you, they ever hang a man on a tree, he's considered a curse. So that before sundown, his body should be taken off the tree so as not to leave a curse in the land. This is precisely why on the night that Jesus was crucified between the two criminals, crucifixion could have been a long two or three day process. The Passover was coming. The Jews asked the Romans to break the legs of the men on the cross so that they would suffocate more quickly, die more rapidly, and then their bodies could be taken down off the curse, off the cross and not be a curse in the land on the Sabbath Passover day. And so 
they came, of course, to the one thief and then the other thief, and then they came to Christ, and they were going to break his legs, but he was already dead. And just to double check, they put the spear through his side, and out came blood and water. And the Lord's body was brought, brought down from the cross. But Paul picked up on this of what the Lord really did for us when he became that curse on the cross in Galatians 3, 10 and 13. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. As it is written, cursed are all those who do not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do that. I mean, if you haven't continued in everything which is written in the law, always you have a curse on you, the curse of sin and death. And the only way you can be delivered by that curse is through Christ, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us, purchased us back from the curse of sin, the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written in Deuteronomy 21, which we just read, <laughs> cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so when Jesus hung on that tree, he bore our curse, our curse of sin, because we did not continue in the law so that we might be redeemed or purchased. And if we're purchased, we're owned. And if we've been purchased by the Lord, we're owned by the Lord. And if the Lord owns us, he can do whatever he wants with us. He's the potter, we're the clay. He's a good God. And he says, follow me. And that's our delight. Lord, have your way. Father, thank you for, for this time and your word tonight. We give you complete control of our lives, our future, our affections. We're thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for what Christ did for us on the tree, becoming a curse so that we might be delivered from the curse of sin and death, so that we might be freed and have clean consciences, so that we could serve you, the one true God. We love you, Lord. When we go from here today, let us go out with joy and with gladness, celebrating you, our faithful Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.